Welcome to For You Radio, where the gospel's for the believer and the unbeliever alike. I'm Craig D'Onofrio, pastor of St. James Lutheran Church in the old Brooklyn neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. Wow, that was impressive. Yeah, I have uh, to do it different just for you every time. Give me a hit on the inhaler, and I'll see if I can do that same thing. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, I am Pastor Troy New, pastor of St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Yes. Do come worship with us. Hmm? Any old time. Well, if you know, if you wish to worship the one true God... Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, through the incarnational Christ. Yeah, absolutely come worship with us. Wow. That sounded really academic. That's pretty good. <laughs> that is that is probably my perennial failing, actually, uh, is uh, getting all nerdy. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. good at nerd. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I know. That was a little rough. <laughs> Go check out 1517.org. We have so many books and all sorts of resources for you, your church, classes online, videos galore on our YouTube channel, podcasts out the wazoo. And I don't even know what a wazoo is, but we got a lot of them. And so go, go to 1517.org, check it all out. Pure grace all the time, 200 proof gospel just for you. Check it out. Uh, Troy, if people wanted to email us, we're going to continue on our email with Jeffrey today. Speaking of email. Yeah. yeah. If other people have questions, thoughts, comments that they would like to see us take two to 15 episodes on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> where would they email and what would they, well, don't, don't say what they would ask, but uh, where would they email us? I'm going to go with what they would ask too. So uh, for instance, you, first you would start. Uh, <laughs> well done. According to Robin Williams, rented lips. Hold on. Uh, anyway, so um, you would start by emailing us at for you radio at fifteen seventeen dot org. Now, what you can email? Uh, we're a perennial favorite uh, fan. Uh, I've used, used that word twice now on the show. Perennial, three times. Uh, we are fans of recipes. We are fans of uh, good, solid theological questions. We're fans of uh, comments, and we're also fans of prayer requests. Yes. So, all of the uh, above. Yeah, any of those above. Yep, there you go. Uh, and also, too, uh, find all our old episodes. And I think we were uh, convinced to do a, a Thanksgiving bonus ode here. So we'll maybe find those at... that actually happened. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Find those at <laughs> foryouradio.org. All right. Yeah. So Jeffrey had written in, and uh, he asked basically about two categories, three questions. So I take it as six, six questions. But do we discount God's actual presence in baptism or the Lord's Supper because of the science of the 21st century, or because we trust in our senses more than we ought, or because the church has preached the fear of idolatry into us for so long? Oh. And so we talked uh, mostly about the Lord's Supper last time. Yes. But we didn't really get into the whole idolatry thing, if I remember right. Uh, we just, we waded into it, and then I realized we have five seconds left in this show. Right, and right. at that point, I stumbled. So why don't we pick it up there? Uh, the fear of idolatry in yeah. okay. God's actual pres the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Now, I do want to back up. Uh, and okay. the last time I know, I mentioned that there were two good Lutheran questions uh, that we could ask this. Okay. Uh, you know, one is, uh, uh, what does this mean? Uh, two is, why do you want to know? And I just realized uh, the third Lutheran answer to this question, these three questions. Yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. Do we discount? Yes. Because of, yes. Because, yes. Yes. Uh, it's all true. This is all very true. Uh, so we do, uh, you got some good insight there, Jeffrey, that uh, we do all that because of those various reasons. But uh, okay, let's launch into idolatry. Uh, now, I was uh, I was getting into a talk on idolatry, uh, indicating that um, our uh, our kind of a Christian evangelical aversion to physical things, right. uh, out of fear of idolatry, because of uh, the long history of the uh, human race building gods for themselves. Right. Yeah, and you you yes. mentioned the. Uh I chopped down a tree, half I use for Isaiah. firewood, yeah. and the other half I build an idol and I give it thanks for all of this <laughs> stuff. <Yeah. laughs> yes. Which is uh, just hilarious. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, and, and throughout the Old Testament, we're continually reminded about these mute and deaf and dumb idols who cannot say, think, or do anything, and yet we bow down before them. Yeah. How ridiculous. Um. Now, we've, we've come a long way 
because we really don't do that anymore. We just worship ourselves now. Sure. Well, That's you know, uh, uh, Martin Luther and Calvin and all the brilliant people who agree with them uh, have all said throughout church's history that the human heart is an idol factory. Yep. Just continually produces idols for itself. It's a great line. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, if we perhaps are uh, smarter than the ancient ones that we no longer carve idols for ourselves and bow down to them as though they are powerful gods, even though we don't do that, we still uh, we worship these little funny green pieces of paper with faces on them. Yes. Uh, yeah, or true. maybe rather not so much the funny green pieces of paper, but uh, your funny plastic card in your wallet that uh, is supposed to have funny green pieces of paper backing it up. It's a blessing and a curse. Yes. Right? So there we go. Uh, so we worship that. We worship our own comfort. We worship our own um, all sorts of things. Our own reason. Yes. Our, our own understanding of things, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and in that, uh, what you had said last week is that we can indeed make certain churchly things into an idol. Um, now, I like to lean into Martin Luther's large catechism because I think this really, really just kind of puts the, the rubber of the road on what an idol is. Um, and Luther says in his large catechism that wherever uh, it is faith alone which makes uh, both God and idol. That if your faith and trust are right, then you have the one true God. If your faith and trust are wrong, then you have an idol. Right. Uh, and whatever you put your faith and trust in, whatever you look to for all goodness and comfort and hope and security, that is your God. Yes. So uh, are we guilty of this in the church sometime? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of times, like, uh, yeah, when it... Um, I've seen it many times in churches where it comes time that the church has shrunk down uh, and they can no longer support the building that they were in. Right. Uh, and, uh, and it's got an old dilapidated school attached to it that's now empty and nothing else is happening. Uh, but someone says, my grandfather was baptized in that building, in that, you know, in that particular baptismal font. We cannot get rid of it. Right. You know, yeah. Because that's my sense of rootedness and my sense of security in knowing that. I have a long history in this physical place. This is always a frustrating thing. And of course, this is running a little far afield, but it, it plays into this. You'll see two or three congregations that have seen their heyday and they are now struggling to keep their doors open. And they're three doors down from each other pretty much. Mm. And they say, well, we would like to merge as long as they sell their property and come to our church. And all <laughs> right. three congregations agree on that. As long as you sell yours and come to ours... That's what counts. Is, is it is yes. is this serving the gospel? Is this serving the word of God? No, but that's my building, and well, my yes. family's history is there, and so it's very important. And yes, it may be important to you, but is it important to the work of the gospel? And no, you can go worship in a storefront. Jesus will still show up. So it's I, okay. I, while we're still, uh, I'm, I'm going to go just a bit further down the rabbit hole. And while we're this far down, we might as well go a little bit further. Uh, that then, I think, uh, really does demonstrate. Um, oh, my brain! Just John, you had a senior moment. My didn't brain you? just locked up just like that. I have. Okay, well, so let's go, let's go back. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, I, did you see the smoke pouring out of my ears for that one I second? I did. Where the, the magic got out. I saw the oh smoke just like goodness. come out of your ears, and the magic's gone. <sighs> Let, let's okay. look at it this way also. Oh, yes, go ahead. We're talking about sacraments, and we were talking before about how there are physical elements attached yes. to God's Word. It's, it's God's Word that does the work, but God attaches them to physical elements, and I contend that this is because we who are physical can point to it and say, there, God is at work there, he's made me a promise, or he's making me a promise oh, yeah. there, right? Yeah. And so we see this... Going way back into the Old Testament, God creating a physical earth with a physical man and a physical sure. woman and breathing his physical ruach, his physical breath into them, giving them his physical life yes. in a real way, both eternal and here on earth. He shows up repeatedly, physically in the Old Testament, a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud, a burning bush, all these different manifestations. We call them theophanies, but it's Christ in the Old Testament showing up. Uh, and doing his God thing, delivering his people. 
Mm-hmm. So why would he just stop doing that all of a sudden? Uh, well, again, <laughs> the uh, the answer is going to be that he doesn't right. stop doing it. Right. Uh, and not even um, – so the way you phrased it earlier is almost that God makes a concession to us as being physical people that he enters into our physical world. I, I'm, I'm going to back that up and say that that's just the way God works, period. Uh, he uh, he tends to work naturally through our own physical realm. Um, not as a concession know, to that, us, but I think from the outset, again, the creation. Yeah, I, is a I great don't example. know that I would say that it's a concession as much as he knows our limitations. And so he says, because you're limited mm-hmm. uh, and this is how I work, you will have this sign to go with sure. my word. There you go. Right? Exactly. And, and, uh, and again, uh, not even because of our limitations, but because that that's him reaching towards us. Yeah, it's how he created us. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, so it's part of his creative way. Right. So the uh, the the um, way to look at this as not being idolatry is that we don't look at the bread and the wine uh, in an idolatrous way Ooh. as though we are worshiping bread and wine, yeah. but rather we are receiving what God gives that comes to the vehicle of bread and wine— uh, but in not an idolatrous way at all. Right. So Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, yeah. this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Right? Take and eat. Not worship. Don't don't, <laughs> Good don't point. put it in a box and bow down to it and pray to it. That's just, that. that's mm-hmm. not how I work here. Uh, don't parade it about. Eat and drink. Right? Sure. That's what it's here for. But at the same time, if we look at First uh, Corinthians, there's a very clear admonition to say, eat and drink this decently and in good order. Yes, yes. So uh, this is not uh, a meal like any other meal. Right. You do not come here and have a big old party, and some of you get drunk, and the rest of you go away hungry. I love, there's, um, there's a line from Caddyshack that St. Paul echoes here. Don't you have homes? <laughs> <laughs> and if you've seen Caddyshack a thousand times like I have, You'd understand. I am astounded that you would go there right now. It was really weird. You. But yeah, that <sighs> common meal you have at home. Go home and eat that common meal. This is not that, right? Right, right. You, yes. Do not drink a whole bunch of, of wine mm-hmm. here and get hammered. That, but, that yeah. is not the way that this is supposed to go. But what this is, is a meal of the new kingdom. And therefore, it's something distinct and different from the meal that you have at home. Right. Uh, and therefore, it should be treated as such. So this is a meal of our new unity in Christ. This is a meal of our new redemption in Christ. This is a meal of our new identity in Christ. And therefore, uh, it is impossible to idolatrize that because it is God himself giving himself to us through it. Right. So, And yet Jesus is the bread of life. So this is certainly a meal we could have every day. But it's it's not to say that it's not – that it's the same as your beef stew at home. You know, it, oh, this I is see. this is yes. a sacred meal, mm-hmm. but it's not it's not one just for special occasions. It's it's daily bread that we could have. You, you know, could. so if yeah, communion yeah, yeah. was offered to you every day, by all means, please do. Well, yeah, it, yeah. unless you're afraid you might get too much Jesus, <laughs> right. too much forgiveness. You well, know, yeah. that could be dangerous. My, my usual response to that is too like, forgiven. Do you do you eat every day? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine said uh, Jesus is the bread of life, not the caviar of life. Right? Caviar you nice. have on special occasions. I don't like caviar, but okay. regardless. Okay, so, so uh, pressing on. We've got there that, um, you know, uh, in the proper understanding of the Lord's Supper, that uh, we identify and recognize that Jesus Christ has brought himself, joined himself to the bread and the wine. Right. And therefore, it is not idolatry to look at those things with great reverence and say, Jesus, you are here in these things right. for me. Now, now we, we are also we go to pains also to not say how Christ is physically and spiritually present here, but just that he is. How is not a good question here because he doesn't tell us. So it's pure speculation. Well, you said last week about the definition of sacrament, of uh, the mysterion, the mystery. Right. Exactly. That's the mystery, so, right? Uh, so even uh, you know sometimes we like to talk. Uh, we probably should talk about not a real presence, uh, but we should talk about a sacramental presence. Yes. I avoid talking about spiritual presence because that um, tends to be a non-physical thing. 
But if we talk about a mysterious sacramental presence, we know that Jesus Christ is truly there in that meal. Right. And yeah. so where we have Jesus, he is there both physically and spiritually. You can't take the two apart. Okay. okay. Let's, Which then let's leads, press us, on to baptism. leads us to baptism. Yeah. So now, uh, Jeffrey does actually say, uh, do we discount God's actual presence in baptism or the Lord's Supper? And that made me think we should talk about the distinctions between how God works and is present in those two things. Right. So uh, you would make a distinction between your dinner and your shower, right? I mean, they're both common things, and they're both good, but they aren't the same thing. Wow. Okay. Yeah, where are we going? Well, Rarely, this, if ever, in my life. Uh, this is the washing of regeneration. This is baptism. Is okay. God, well, First Peter now, 3... I, I will say that uh, probably like very, very early on in uh, in my married life, my wife and I probably did that cute uh, newlywed thing where we had dinner in the bathtub together or something like that. That's but, weird. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll almost always right, the difference would be uh, your dinner is not your shower. You're, you're weird because you're dealing with crumbs, and that's not good. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember how that ended up either. First, <laughs> Probably pretty poorly, to be honest, like a bunch of newlywed things. First Just, Peter yeah. 3, uh, I want to I start at uh, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison— because they formerly did not obey when God was when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight persons in all were brought safely through the water baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as removal of the dirt of bo- from the body but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is seated in, and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, powers having been subjected to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the Greek there is antitypon, an antitype of of this is baptism, right? So actually the flood is a sign for baptism in a very real way here when you mm-hmm. look at the, the syntax. Okay, so the flood and the bapti- baptism, what happened in the flood? The sins of the world were washed away, Right. They were drowned. Yes. All um, that was sinful was drowned. Quite unfortunately so for everybody. Except, except for the eight and all. Who were who saved. Were through water, it says yes. here. Yes. Right? And baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. It is the baptism in this text that is appealing to God. Not you, through mm-hmm. your baptism. Right. You are not making an appeal. The baptism is the appeal to God because God is at work in baptism. Jesus is God. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, he appeals to the judgment of God on your behalf, and you are declared clean, not guilty, righteous in the hands of God. And so baptism is Christ at work in the water, which is an appeal to the judgment of God, saying not guilty. Yes, there we go. Yes, not so much a good conscience that I can feel confident about myself, but a good conscience, a good appeal that Christ has done this thing for me. Right. So yes. I look at baptism and I say, there, Lord Jesus, there, you came, you washed me, you redeemed me, there you made go. an appeal on my behalf, There we go. and I am nothing but given to, I am a recipient. Uh, notice the Bible always is passive. Be baptized. Not go baptize yourself. Be baptized. So right? uh, you, you hit upon something really important there, is that um, while God offers the same thing, uh, the same grace, if you will, through baptism and the Lord's Supper, he actually kind of does two different things. Right. Or he approaches it maybe from a different angle. Uh, in baptism, he unites us to Christ. That's what we just read in First Peter. It's what we also read in Romans chapter um, six, five or six. Yeah, it's five or six. You know, Romans. It's Something. one of one of those. You find it for yourself if you want to. You know. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, so in baptism, he unites us to Christ. He gives us the benefit of his cross, of his tomb, of his resurrection. 
Right. He makes us new creation. He adopts us into his family. Uh, but he's working through all that. Yes. Now, uh, in this, we should also know, then know, too, that he works all that through his word, and the word is that which is united to the water in baptism. Right. His word of promise. Right. Right? But in the Lord's Supper, Christ unites himself to the elements. Yes. So uh, the, the idea of God being, um, what did Jeffrey say? Um, God's real presence, actual presence in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, we actually describe that two different ways. God is actually present in baptism through his word, his spirit, his work. Right. In the Lord's Supper, he's really present yeah. because he has united himself to the bread and the wine. Well, we will say also that in where, where the word goes forth in all its forms, both proclaimed and mm-hmm. attached to these physical elements, the Holy Spirit goes out with it. And the yep. Holy Spirit is at work, and the Holy Spirit testifies to Christ. That is the comfort that he brings us. Absolutely. It is finished in Christ, mm-hmm. and so the Holy Spirit brings us to Christ in a very real way. Yeah. Uh, where God is at work, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all working together in concert. So, Matter of fact, uh, if I can the, say— In the Lord's Supper, when you receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the Holy Spirit's at work there, too. Yeah. Yeah. If I can say, uh, that's the Holy Spirit's job. By the way, yes, that to bring you to Christ, yes, uh, not to point to himself, nope, not to show off uh, or anything else like that. Uh, we call him the shy member of the Trinity because he totally remains behind the scenes all the time and is constantly saying, "Hey, let me introduce you to this guy I know." Right. So, um, but yeah, the, the difference again is in the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ binds Himself to the elements. In baptism, God uh, combines His Word with the water. Right. Yeah. I want to go back to 1 Peter 3 also and just stress this. Baptism, which corresponds to the flood, to this, Mm -hmm. now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal (laughs) to God for a good conscience. Good point. And and we we make great pains that without the word of God, it's just Cleveland tap water. It's just another hand washing or face washing or bath or shower or whatever. Uh, It's just a cleansing but with the word of God, it is a washing of regeneration. Yeah. Right? So it is the word that does everything. The word that does it, right. But and, that and, doesn't make the other negotiable. I mean, well, no. if it's the word of God, then I don't need baptism, right? Well, <laughs> actually, you do, because God says, that's how I bring you the word, right? Uh, so, uh, by the way, and a little shout out to my Baptist friends, uh, all my Baptist friends who have ever said, if you were baptized as an infant, all you got was wet. Well, and the word of God. Yeah, we'll see. First Peter's <laughs> going to refute that. First Peter says, oh, not only did you get wet, which you certainly did, but you also got a good conscience. Right. And a conscience.